I'd like to welcome Pindar van Amen to the stage. He is the founder, creator, inventor, computer scientist, brain behind uh, Cloud Painter, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about AI and creativity. So, Pintar, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tyson. Thanks, so. so uh, my art is designing creative algorithms, and, uh, and I like to build robots so I can bring these algorithms, so I can make paintings and bring these algorithms into the real world, make an artifact. My uh, first paintings, a long time ago, were, were really simple. I, they, were, they would just dip, my first robots would dip a brush in paint and then drag that brush from point to point, connect the dots, basically. And I would also have them, then after that I added, I was like, you know what, I can also have them color by numbers. So I had them fill in areas with colors. And this is when I started showing it to friends, and I had a friend give me a comment that uh, I took to art. He looked at this and he said, congratulations, Pindar, You've, I got the perfect name for your new invention. You should call it the printer. <laughs> and, and, he, and he was right. And when I heard that, uh, I, it just became my goal. It's like, I got to do everything I can with these robots to make them more than just printers. So one of the first things I did was um, I added a camera so that they could watch their own work. You know, you've all had your printers run out of ink and it just keeps on printing. I couldn't have my robots do that. They had to see what they were doing, react to it. And then I added AI so that their reactions could be more interesting. And there's all sorts of different AI algorithms. There's so many. And, I, and just every time I'd learn something new, I'd, I'd try and say, can my painting robots use this to make more art or do something different? And then I, I started, I was like, you know, I need to teach them more. So I put them on the internet and I let anyone teleoperate them. But at the same time, I, I would have my robots watch how they're being used and learn from that. So, you know, like a couple years ago, they're way more than just printers. I, I think they started painting with artistic style. I just got my first big review from, uh, from New York City uh, art critic Jerry Saltz. And, and it was an interesting review for me because he looked at this and he says, you know, it doesn't really look like a computer made it. Um, never mind that the next thing he said was, that doesn't make it any good. But at least, <laughs> at least it's come to a point where 10 years ago no one considered this art, now it's at least considered bad art. So if we look at uh, the processes, I try and get as much AI in, in here as possible. And, and I was just realized something as I was listening to yesterday's and today's panels, is there's a lot of AI from Germany in here. Um, I'll talk to you about my three favorites, and, and I have dozens of AI algorithms in there. Two of them are from Germany. Uh, and, and then I'll go into detail on the third, which is out of the University of Montreal. But one thing I told you, I like to put cameras to watch. And that's something that me and another robot artist, uh, or art group that's making robot paintings, E. David, out of the University of Constance. It's Thomas Lindemeyer and Oliver Doyson. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your names right. But they have one of the best painting robots in the world, right here in Germany. And then the second is from Beth Gay Labs. And that's, you guys have seen this a lot, that's style transfer, and you'll see that, I don't have a laser to point at it, but you can see where it says CNNs, so I'm doing uh, contextual style transfer. Well, style transfer is, is, is a neural net where you can give it a picture of a Van Gogh, and then you can give it a photograph, and, and it will reimagine or it will remake that photo in the style of Van Gogh. It's gonna transfer that style. And that's out of Beth Gay Labs. That's the first time I heard of it and started using it. And those really had a good influence on my art, and they've really brought my art to another level. So the third one out of University of Montreal is up in the top left-hand corner, and that's where, you know, this is how far I've gone away from printers. A printer, you have to give an image to print. You no longer have to give images to my robots to print. They will imagine their own images. And in this case, they're going to imagine faces. So uh, here's a face. And, and it's not the greatest face, I know, but these robots are new to imagining. And, um, and don't judge them, but you can judge me for seeing that robots are imagining. And I gotta back that up, especially with this crowd, you know, to make that claim. But I have, a, I have a thought experiment that's gonna help me make that claim and let you decide for yourself whether or not uh, computers are imagining things right now. Um, in this thought experiment, I want you guys to imagine a face then I'm gonna go into details with exactly how this face was imagined, and I'm gonna let you guys compare and decide for yourself if, if we're living in a world where machines are now have an imagination. So to start this, I mean, just like, if you need to close your eyes, do it. Just try and think of a face of someone you know, or even better, someone you don't know. Just try and imagine a face. Give you a couple seconds to do it. Try and picture it like you're seeing a photo. Okay. 
Now, I don't know how you did that. Uh, I, I would have to be a neuroscientist. I'm just an artist. But I, I know exactly how my robots do that. And they do that with a relatively recent new uh, algorithm called Generative Adversarial Networks. This is the one that comes out of the University of Montreal with a team led by Ian Goodfellow. And uh, it's doing some pretty amazing things. Quickly hit, but I think it's already been covered, so I won't even spend any time on this, what a neural network is, an artificial neural network. And here's an animation I made of one on the left compared to actual live neuronal activity. And since neural networks are meant to, are modeled on how the brain works, you know, when you animate it like this, it's easy to see the similarities. And they're very good at doing classifications, among other things. In this case, you showed an image of a bridge, it turns that image of a bridge into numbers, calculates it all the way through the neural network, and out from the other side says, hey, this is a bridge. It's very good at that. Uh, and generative, generative adversarial networks are actually two neural networks. They're fighting against each other in just the right way, and they're also working with each other in just the right way that they're doing something that I think is, I think is really interesting. I, I would even go so far as saying it's being creative. Um, so, I'm going to avoid the math. I, I showed these slides with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of neurons and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the weights to my wife one time, and she said, you've got to get rid of that. And, and she gave me the greatest idea, and this is it. She said, explain these networks in terms of personalities and how the personalities fight. So I'm going to introduce you to the first of the two neural networks. It's a discriminator. And the discriminator, you can think of the discriminator as a very, very, as a face expert. It is very good at discriminating when something's a face or not. It's been shown thousands of faces, tens of thousands of faces. So if you show it that picture of the bridge, it knows immediately it's not a face. You show it a picture of my son, and it gives a thumbs up. It's a, it's a face critic, that's the face, and it's a discriminating face critic. Um, so in opposition to the discriminator is the second neural network, and we're going to consider this one like a free-spirited artist. And, and the reason, or the way this is opposite the discriminator is, is two primary, or a lot of ways, but two primary ways are that, well, the discriminator was a face expert. This generator knows nothing about faces in the beginning. Totally naive. Uh, has never seen a face, doesn't know what a face looks like, just a free-spirited artist, like I was saying. And the second way that it's different is, well, if you remember the discriminator, you show it a picture of a, of a picture, and then it decides whether it's a face or not. The generator works in reverse. You start off with the idea of face, and then it actually tries to build a picture. So, that should, if you're thinking about that, how can the generator build a picture if it's never seen one before? It's just this complete mess of random numbers. And it gets creative, and it tries, and here's its first attempt. And it's a random, like I was mentioning, this neural network is a random mess of numbers and, and weights, so it doesn't know how to make a face, but it's, it's fearless and it gives it a try. Discriminator looks at it, uh, there's no faces there. But it does a couple other things, but the only one I'll go into detail with is it gives a critique, like any good art critic would, and says, you know what about your, your image here? Here's the stuff that works, here's the stuff that looks like faces, and here's the stuff that doesn't. And then the generator takes that in, and uh, you've seen these neural networks with these large lists of nodes with weights. Those all get adjusted just a little, based on the critique. So then the generator tries again, gets rejected again, gets uh, critiques again 80 more times, and this is it after 80 tries. Screaming looks, no faces. Generator takes critique, adjusts itself, and then another 80 tries, rejections, critiques later, more rejection, and then at 240 tries, uh, rejections, critiques later, things are starting to show, um, faces are emerging, right? Um, at 330, you're actually starting to see, well, you don't see features yet, but I see faces, but still rejection. 440, discriminator is getting confused. I don't know if this, this looks like it's about 1,000. And at 4,000 tries later, a generator who's never seen a face before is pulling out features with faces. And these people don't exist, right? They're totally imagined. So, yes, the discriminator has seen 25,000 faces before and is, is an expert on faces, but that generator has never seen a face and it's already creating these. So, you know, so watch here. It took me until I was in high school until I could make portraits, but watch here as this neural network uh, learns to make portraits in about 10 seconds. And, and this is what it looks like. And so, this is, this is the weird part, because this is where I, I asked you, remember I asked you to like, do that thought experiment? 
And I'm hoping that this isn't what went on in your head. It, would it went anything like this? This is how we find out if we have robots in the audience. So no one, so no one, yeah, but I, I don't, I see this and it's interesting, but let me show you what, what part appeals to me, what I, I look at as an artist. I'm going to go to the steps between, that was 4,000 steps, I'm going to go to the steps between 100 and 300, where like, you know, it's just this foggy image, and things start emerging. And this, this feels familiar to me. I don't, I don't exactly see this, but it feels familiar to me as part of the creative process. Because what we just described was a generator starting random noise and turning into order. And, and when I try to be creative and I start a painting, I start with, I try and start with random inspirational ideas. And, and other parts of me say, no, that's too wild. People wouldn't understand that. Calm that down a little. And I almost feel like it's this fight in me between a generator that's trying to be free-spirited and, and a discriminator that's trying to worry about what the culture thinks about what I'm making. And, and I see this battle going on inside my mind. I think it's a good analogy. And beyond being just an analogy, I wonder if there's actually parts of our brains when we try and imagine that do start off with firing random things and other parts of our brains act as the discriminator trying to bring those things into, uh, trying to get them under control. Um, this is my recent painting. This is where I think things are going with artificial creativity. What it tells me is that whether or not you all here accept that that algorithm is creative. Um, at least I hope you accept that it is successfully bringing order out of chaos. And, and to me, I don't, I don't know, that's a pretty good definition of creativity, but you don't have to accept that. But here's something I think that is hard to dispute. Whether or not you accept the algorithm is uh, creative, at least I hope you would accept that it's a creative tool for me, the artist. And that's, that's pretty profound because Traditionally, creative tools like a typewriter only let writers write more efficiently, or keyboards let artists experiment with sound, or Photoshop lets you mess with the different filters and make cool things. It makes you more efficient as an artist. But these new creative tools, powered by neural networks, they, they go beyond just making you more efficient. They actually make you more creative. And that's, that's something we've never had before. And, and I can't help but think that we're going into this future where anyone here will soon have tools like this uh, that'll help you if you want to write a novel, it'll help you write a decent novel. Or like me, what I'm shooting for, it'll help me paint uh, a masterpiece. Uh, or it'll help anyone that wants to compose a symphony. And, and when I imagine this future, I'm really excited because I see a future where anyone who wants to be an artist can be an artist and, and fine arts can be as, as common as social media posts. When I think about this, I just can't wait to see what this world looks sounds and feels like, and I think it's coming pretty soon. Oh, thank you.